This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Friends, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, the faculty, students, administrative staff of Columbia Theological Seminary, we welcome each and every one of you on this joyous occasion. We will lift up the name that is above all names and truly worthy to be praised as we have gathered to celebrate the milestones of our students. Students that have and are continuing to prepare themselves for acts of service to Christ and the church. And we celebrate with you. Let us worship our Lord. Please sit or stand as the Spirit leads and join us in God's call to worship. Holy, holy, holy God, eternal love and beauty, source, guide, and goal, the desire that is with us. Holy, holy, holy God, creating word enfleshed among us, showing each of us the way of life, the way of truth, and love. Holy, holy, holy God, restless spirit, giver of life, abiding within and all around us, guiding us in all our ways. Glory, Glory to, to God, God and, and to God's, God's beloved earth, in, in which we live and move and, move and have our being. Glory, Glory to God and peace to God's people on earth.
In this Easter season, we give thanks that in Jesus Christ, the powers of evil and oppression have been overcome. Yet we dwell in a world that bears the mark of sin. Trusting in God's abundant mercy, revealed in the waters of the earth and imparted by the waters of baptism, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Please join me in the prayer of confession printed in your order of service. Merciful God, you have told us what kind of worship you value to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke, to offer food to the hungry, and to satisfy the needs of the afflicted. But we fear what this worship will cost us. Forgive us for substituting a humble pose, a garment of sackcloth, a covering of ashes, a carefully worded creed, for living into your vision of justice. Forgive us that we may serve you with whole hearts. Siblings of the risen Christ, According to the abundance of God's mercy towards all of creation, I declare to you in the name of Christ that we are forgiven. In these waters of baptism, we are liberated from all that separates us from God, made new to go forth rejoicing in joy and in the challenge of our call. We are those whom God has redeemed. We are set free to become the people that God has called us to be. We are God's beloved community. Please share with one another signs of peace, offering the words, peace be with you, to your neighbors and the pews near you. May peace be with you. to see your 
reading from Jeremiah chapter 31. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A reading from 2 Corinthians. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Surely we do not need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you, do we? You yourselves are our letters, written on our hearts, known and read by all, and you show that you are a letter of Christ prepared by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets that are human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, not that we are qualified of ourselves to claim anything as coming from us. Our qualification is from God, who has made us qualified to be ministers of a new covenant, not of letter, but of spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The word of God for the people of God. Good evening. evening. I'm speaking from the floor tonight, not as a statement uh, about women's place or the place of people of color. But I am speaking here because I need an accommodation. The church has still not quite figured it out what to do about persons with disabling conditions. So tonight, I speak, from you, speak to you from the floor, but because God lives. I wanna say thank you for this opportunity to offer this sermon. Um, 
The seminary didn't have to invite me, but you did, and I am grateful. Uh, I want to thank the music ministry. Wow, you've already brought us to the mountaintop. <laughs> Let us pray. O oh, Spirit of the living God, descend on this body of your servants. Open our hearts and our minds to receive a word from you. Speak, Lord, for we, your servants, are listening. Amen. Tomorrow, you will receive a credential that signifies your readiness or continued readiness for ministry or for further study. You will serve and study in a variety of contexts with diverse groups of people and individuals. We here at the seminary hope and believe that we have prepared you academically. Sometimes, though, we can become overly attached to our academic credentials. And sometimes, when challenged by those with whom we are doing ministry, we pull out those credentials. We point to the diploma on the wall, and we say, that's why I'm here. But isn't there another reason? In Corinthians, we find Paul dealing with status challenges from members of the church at Corinth. Some itinerant evangelists have arrived in Corinth and members of the church that Paul founded begin to challenge his authority. Paul tries, at first, a conciliatory tone to reaffirm their relationship as partners and co-workers in ministry. But eventually he becomes defensive. And he feels and even says to them, I cannot compete with the rival evangelists. Then Paul reminds them that although he may not have the credentials or letters of recommendation like those of his rivals, this church that he has founded is his letter of recommendation to be known and read by all. He is credentialed by God. In the words of the text, we are not competent of ourselves to claim anything as coming from us. Our competence is from God. Thus Paul reminds himself, as well as the Corinthians and us, God's grace is the source of any confidence and competence that we can claim for doing ministry. By faith through Jesus Christ, we receive God's grace. As we accept this God's gift of grace, we become conscious of our in sufficiency. And ironically, it is when we affirm our insufficiency that we are actually rendered authentically human enough to fulfill a call to ministry. The text reminds us that upon confessing our insufficiency, professing Jesus as Savior, and accepting the gift of God's grace, we acquire the means to fulfill a call to ministry. So although the diploma that you have achieved is an important credential, preparedness for ministry is based upon another data point. The mirror text in Jeremiah and 2 Corinthians read this evening provide that further data point the covenant written on our hearts. In the words of the text, our competence is from God, who has made us confident to be ministers of a new covenant, not of letter, but of spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit 
gives life. So what are the earmarks of this new covenant? First, it is a deepened relationship with God and a new way of relating to others. This new covenant takes the old covenant to a next level. Kathleen O'Connor writes of this next level of the covenant in her book, Jeremiah, Pain and Promise, in these words. The new covenant will be profoundly egalitarian. It will grant no individual or group spiritual superiority in the community. From the least to the greatest, all shall know me, end of quote. Members of God's family will share equally in human dignity and in participation in God's life. All shall know God. Yes, you have studied Greek and or Hebrew and can write your own translation of the word of God. Just be certain that the translation that you have written is delivered with God-given confidence and not a bookish arrogance. For a bookish arrogance could prevent those to whom you are preaching or teaching from actually hearing through you, thus says the Lord. Second, the covenant of the Spirit is not legalism. We no longer just know the rules and follow them. The rules become the fabric of our being. They are internalized resources. The covenant of the Spirit means rules provide guidance, not all the answers. Remember how Jesus responded when asked about his disciples plucking grain on the Sabbath? The Sabbath was not made for humankind and not humankind, excuse me. The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. I grew up with rules from my grandparents about what you should not do on Sunday. Don't play cards. Don't do household chores like washing clothes. Now, I found those rules and others somewhat trying because I wondered why. They wanted us to make Sunday truly a day set apart from worldly things that we did on other days. So growing up while I was finding these rules try trying, it is as an adult who has internalized such rules that the spirit of those rules guides me to make Sunday a time to break with the busyness of the past week and prepare to engage in the upcoming week refreshed. For those of you who pastor, I realize that Sunday is one of your busiest days. Still, I hope, I pray, that you can develop healthy Sunday rhythms of prayerful, active engagement that will feed your soul and ultimately shore you up to be the pastoral presence and provide pastoral care during the many unexpected things that happen in the lives of the persons and families that you are serving. The First Nations version of the Bible speaks of the new covenant in these words. For it is creator himself who has chosen and prepared us to tell others the meaning and purpose of his God's peace treaty. This new peace treaty does not depend on written words, but what 
the Spirit writes on our hearts brings life. You have a peace treaty with God. Listen for and follow the leading of the Spirit. Be guided by the energy of the Spirit so that we can engage the powers that perpetuate the omnipresence of violence. Later in 2 Corinthians, we are also reminded that through Christ we have been reconciled to God to do a ministry of reconciliation, to be transformative reconcilers. As ministers of the new covenant of the Spirit, we are credentialed to do ministry against the grain of our 21st century culture of absolutism. This culture of absolutism is why we are polarized inside the church and within society. Everybody needs to be right. We live in opposition. We live as us versus them. And unfortunately, we Christians frequently perpetuate the absolutism, especially when we want to be prophetic. Somehow we have turned being prophetic into calling others out. We are what one author calls madvocates, those who try to change minds through anger, righteous indignation, guilting, gossiping, and moral outrage. When being prophetic is solely about calling others out, we have turned from the first work of prophecy. That first work is being courageous enough to face our failures to live as ministers of the new covenant of the spirit. In our culture of absolutism, our theological convictions are binary, rigid, non-empathetic, and non-responsive. Our theological absolutism begins with the creation of humanity as a binary act, particularly the creation of gender as opposites. Church officials and members then support exclusion because they claim to be compelled by a biblical theological imperative to exclude. Our theological positions have become about the intrinsic worth of individuals and groups of people established in binary and fixed terms. Who's worthy and who's not? What God has ordained and what God has not. We make such claims because we assert that God stands apart from creation and is not a creator in relationship with the creation. The opening stanza, stanza to James Weldon Johnson's poem, The Creation, points us toward this relational creator. And he says, <clears throat> and God stepped out on space. And God looked around and said, I'm lonely. I'll make me a world. We have been created out of God's loneliness to be in relationship with God and one another. So what we affirm of the minist as ministers of the new covenant has certain earmarks. First, any person or group asserting their theological position with such fervor, with such certitude that they cannot hear any other position becomes a theological absolutist. Theological absolutism is not solely the prerogative of conservatives. 
In other words, when the rightness of your conservative or liberal position overrides a willingness to engage those who hold differing positions, you are a theological absolutist. Second, <clears throat> living the new covenant of the spirit means we are, we are the living presence of God through Jesus Christ. Our theological ethical imperative is to be attuned to, to answer the cries of persons hurting from violence, physical, mental, emotional, cultural violence in our homes, in our workplaces, in our churches, even in our seminaries. Because unless we are ready to be the living presence of God, and we render those persons invisible, we diminish our humanity. And we actually are relinquishing our call to ministry. Being God's presence in the world, we fulfill the call to ministry, nurturing and preserving life <clears throat> by any means necessary. Being God's presence in the world, we must not get caught up in ministry as an activity of meeting endless expectations of others. Being God's presence in the world, we do ministry confidently and competently through a searching, through a receiving, through a responding love. That is the love that God has given us to be and share with others. Finally, the clarion call today is to respect and affirm the intersectional, the multivariegated ways we must live as moral community. The clarion call is not to settle for toleration, not to settle for color blindness, not to settle for the redemptive suffering of some. We must address the conflicts of violence and counterviolence. The clarion call is to break our complicity in these conflicts of violence. We must break our complicity with the harms inflicted through hate speech or physical assaults or even by the exploitation of spiritual beliefs and religious claims. The clarion call is to stop rendering those we consider our enemies expendable and thus outside of moral community. The clarion call is to be invitational and expand our moral community based upon justice and compassion and responsiveness to the needs of others around us. Finally, doing ministry against the grain means that each of us and all of us must diminish our complicity daily with all that creates violence in ourselves as well as in our lives locally and the lives of others globally. We must learn to think ourselves outside of our closed ethical boxes. We must nurture our moral imagination because ethical reasoning is actually based on the images and metaphors we hold. What images of God feed your soul? What images of creation center all inhabitants of earth thriving? How do you imagine 
peace beyond the violence of our time. Ministers of the new covenant of the Spirit, we are called to do ministry against the grain. are God's people, holy, beloved, and claimed in the waters of baptism, remembering God's call upon each of us to care for one another and for all creation. 
we invite our candidates for graduation to come forward for anointing that they may be upheld by the power of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in God's presence, the spirit that upheld our ancestors and all those who have gone before us. May our students graduating this year and our graduates from 2020 and 2021 who desire to receive an anointing, please come forward at this time.
pray with me? God of joy and hope, we thank you for this time of celebration of these graduates. Your spirit of wisdom has empowered our hard work and discipline in such a way that our hunger for learning has been nourished with knowledge, with discovery, sometimes discomfort, creativity, determination, resilience, and innovation. May we choose this chapter of our journey in prayerful gratitude for the many blessings and challenges that have made this moment real and also filled with hope. In gratitude, we pray for our families, ancestors, and the many who have sacrificed and worked to see us to this hopeful moment. In gratitude, we pray for the faculty, administrators, and staff who have challenged, cared, and crafted us along this academic journey. In gratitude, we pray for all students who've taught us about friendship, collaboration, sharing, and collegiality. God, even as we have faced challenges and accomplished much, we understand that our lives move into a new chapter where there will be more challenges to face and more will be demanded of us as we lean into our calling. May your grace cover our anxieties and fears so that we may continue in this journey. Give us patience and hope to energize our search for work that seeks justice and equity. Give us courage to face the challenges of, and of carving out a place in society where we might live in peace, service, and gratitude. Give us strength to stand in resistance to systems of injustice and oppression and to always rely on you and others to work toward liberation. May your spirit guide us as we unfold the next chapters of our lives. Help us to embody your goodness in the world. May this celebration be a reflection of the blessing we find in knowing your love for the world. We rejoice in you, our source of life. Amen. We invite you to join us in meeting future students' emergencies as you leave. Ushers will be collecting offering at each door as you leave. Your generous support of your students facing unexpected difficulties is greatly appreciated. The Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine up his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord's face will turn toward you and give
upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and your children and their children and your children and their children and their children may God's presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you God is with you God is with you may God's presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you God is with you God is with you in the morning and the evening in your coming and your going and your weeping and your rejoicing God is for you 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 Part this evening, let us covenant anew to accept the ministry of reconciliation that God has given us. Let us unite through the covenant of the Spirit to do ministries that will inspire and empower nonviolent change for justice. Let us go on our way in joy. God. Now may the grace of God, the love of Christ, and the fire of the Holy Spirit abide with you today and always. And the church said, Amen. Amen.